Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, just before we start, I want to remind you, our friend Michael David Wilson at This Is Horror Podcast, he has a consultation for editing and writing. Two noteworthy people that he has worked with is Josh Mallerman, author of Bird Box, and David Moody. For more information, go to michaeldavidwilson.co.uk slash editing. Welcome to Dead Headspace, a part of Silver Shamrock's Horrorcast, a podcast network that includes Killing Time with Silver Shamrock and Unburying the Dead, where we exhume classic horror paperbacks for the new generation. And we are going to be releasing a new episode uh, either later this month or we're going to be doing it November 1st. So we've been on a hiatus, me, Ken, and Brennan will be back. Unfortunately, Well Red Beard, aka Kevin, won't be with us, but we are still best of buddies. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And today we are talking to the author of Red Station, amongst other stories, Kenzie Jennings. How are you, Kenzie? Fine. You know, it's funny. I'm just, I just noticed that the name on here is my, my full name, Mackenzie. <laughs> I just now noticed that, but yeah, I, Kenzie's, Kenzie's good. Yeah. I'm great. Thanks. <laughs> False advertisement, Mackenzie. <laughs> why, why do, why do you go with Kenzie? Um, cause it's, it's much more informal and my friends have always called me that. So it just, it's just better for me. I think Mackenzie makes it sound like I'm going to get in trouble by my dad. So <laughs> No. <laughs> if I took that route, I would have used Patty McDonough because my closest of friends call me that. So that would have been actually people might think I'm a girl if they Patty? Or yeah. what but is it it's not with two T's though. Is it like Patty with D's? I've never even asked them. <laughs> well, I mean they're just saying it, right? So they're just saying it. Uh let's just jump into the first question. What got you into horror? No, oh, okay. Um uh, I kind of attribute it to my dad in a way he was he's not a horror fan and my mom is, wasn't either um, he back in the early 80s um, it was like 19, 1981 ish around that time frame he went to a movie with a friend of his and came back absolutely terrified I mean he was like I had never seen him like that and um, he had nightmares for weeks and this is a man who served you know he served in the military you know, and he was a surgeon. So it wasn't like he didn't know what trauma was like. I mean, he, but something freaked him out. And he had gone to see an American werewolf in London. And he thought that the transformation scene was so realistic. Like he could totally believe that the, the effects, you know, Dick Miller's effects on it were just amazing. And um, I always wanted to know what it was that made him scared. You know, it was almost like, because this was a scary man. He was, you know, he he had some some anger issues that we won't get into. Um, and I thought that this was kind of, it was kind of interesting that something would scare the scary man, you know. So I, uh, I just started looking up for books in the library, you know, scary books and had librarians help me. And, and it just kind of came from there. Um, so I always credit that as kind of a, horror is kind of a talisman that protected me from the scary man. Like, I know what's gonna scare you. And it kind of worked, you know, every once in a while, my <laughs> sisters and I would bring up at the dinner table, oh yeah, well, you know what? An American werewolf in London was, if we said that title, he just went, we're not gonna talk about that. Not gonna talk about that movie. You girls are not gonna see that movie. <laughs> but anyway, um, I did see the movie obviously eventually. Um, and I found, my sisters and I found it hilarious because it is partially a comedy, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we liked the transformation scene, but we couldn't understand why our father was so scared of it. So anyway, I credit that for getting into horror. Um, and it took a long time for me to, to figure that out because I, I never wrote it until recently. I never, hmm. I didn't start writing it until like 2017-ish, you know? Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, I'd been writing all kinds of other genres, but I'd not... Um, and I was, even at the time I was dabbling into like a, like chick lit. So it's kind of, it was, it's weird. It's weird, you know, jump, but everybody in my personal, in my life knew that I would eventually get to horror because I've always liked the genre. So, and here I am. So there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Just real quick before Brandon, I'm sure you feel like he's going to jump in. Uh, I think a lot of the effects has to do with Rick Bakeman, he's like one Baker, of the- Baker, that's it. What did I uh, say? Rick, Rick Baker. Baker. Did I? No, I <laughs> just said I Bakeman. Know. 
I just said Bakeman. I meant Rick Baker. My fault. My apologies. And just a few <laughs> to Rick, who is who is listening. To, yeah. <laughs> Inside. I, know, I, I know a Rick Miller, and I think that's why I said that. I don't know why. I, I was like, somebody, somebody, Rick, something. Okay, it's totally <laughs> so yeah, no, totally, yeah. And a few noteworthy movies that he's been on uh, makeup artists or special effects is the original Star Wars, like you said, American Werewolf in London, The Howling, uh, some X Men, Hellboy, and the list is very long. Well, I don't wanna, yeah. One of my favorites yeah. is uh, Men in Black. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That was just fun. And that uh, big, uh, there's this one scene uh, when Will Smith is seeing every, all the aliens uh, at their headquarters. And there's this big, looks like a maggot. That creeps me out as a little <laughs> kid. I always thought the Vincent D'Onofrio character in it, the, the possessed redneck, the, the alien mm -hmm. that became the redneck, the redneck alien um, was pretty frightening too. And yeah. of course he's such a great actor too. So yeah. yeah, but the, the, the makeup effects for that were absolutely incredible too. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought when you brought, I thought that's where you were going with Men in Black. Edgar, yeah. your skin is hanging off your bones. <laughs> um, so, Kenzie, you mentioned a couple things I want to dive into. You mentioned that, um, that the people around you knew that you were going to be a horror writer. Would you say that they knew it before you did, that, that you'd eventually um, go down that path? I don't think that they necessarily thought I'd be a horror writer. I knew that they that I would that I, I, I they knew that I would come back to the genre in, in some way, shape, or form. I actually was when I was younger, my goal was to be a screenwriter. So that, you know, the, the I guess the, the idea was I was going to write a horror film, you know, at some point. Um I, and and they they knew that only because they knew me and they knew that I loved horror films and I, you know, I was kind of obsessed about talking about them and things. So yeah, I think that's probably it. You know, your friends, your good friends know you and family, family too. We won't talk about my dad, but you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you, you mentioned that, sorry, this is a weird segue because I'm gonna kind of talk about your dad here, but um, you mentioned, you know, with, with the whole American werewolf in Paris, you know, that it just stuck London. out to you. London. 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 Yes, no, yes. no, not Paris. No. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's a different country, you idiot. The, that is a different film. Film. <laughs> different film. Yeah, not the same at all. Um, you know, that that was a, a moment that, you know, scared a person that generally didn't react like that to horror movies. So I, I wonder, like, what kind of horror movie or literature uh viewer slash reader are, are you do you have things like that that affect you viscerally and how yes. does that relate to like your creating um yeah um I, I i mean obviously and the the weirdest part about all of this right now is that i'm writing in a subgenre that i never would have thought i'd be writing in to begin with because of that um in extreme splatter punk, you know, that, that that area mm -hmm. um the the uh, body horror and body trauma has always freaked me out, I, I, as always. And I put it in my writing. Um, and I don't know why I put it in my writing. I think it, the, the logic is um, I put it in my writing so that um, I can control it. I guess I guess that's the best way to put it. I, I, I don't know. Um, and not only that, I want to put something in that freaks me out because I think it will freak out somebody else as well. So um, yeah, things think really grotesque things too uh, with body. Um, Trauma to the head is the worst for me and eyeball horror. I can't, I can't <laughs> yeah. so I put it in my books. Yeah, okay, that's that's exactly what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I can't, and it has to do with erasing one's features. That freaks me out so much. I, I guess because eyes are the windows to the soul, you know, and your face is, is the first thing you see is it's somebody's face. So yeah, <laughs> I hope that kind of answers that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Did you I mean, guys see you... Ho Hostel real quick? Yes, no. yes. Is it Hostel 1 or Hostel 2? It's either, yeah, I forget which one, but I'm just saying about the eyeball scene. Oh, that was the first one. That was um, yeah. the Japanese woman. Yeah, and <laughs> and was it, Taka was it Takashi Miyake who was the torturer, the, he, the Japanese filmmaker who did Audition? Um, I think that was him, but I'm not sure. Any, any extreme horror fans can probably correct me on that. Um, but yeah, no, I, the Hostel movies, you know, I never liked those movies, but then I revisited them after I started writing this and I started doing a little more research into why Eli Roth had, had made it and everything and, and realized that 
he was really wanting to make a film, the first one of The Ugly American. And I, and I started appreciating it a lot more. That the, the guys, the, 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 the guys in the, in the first one were very unlikable. You know, they, yeah. they, they weren't good guys and uh, kind of scummy, frat bros, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, it was kind of like, well, they kind of got what they deserved, you know, and, and they were nosing around when they shouldn't have done that. And, you know, getting involved with women, they shouldn't have gone, getting involved, gotten involved with. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I started liking the hostile films a lot more after that. That makes total sense. <laughs> I, didn't he do uh, Cabin Fever too? Yes, yeah. That I, I'm too, not, the first Cabin Fever. Yeah, yeah, he did that. I, I'm not a fan of that one. Um, yeah, and again, it's another one of those, there was no justification for it. It was just kind of loathsome, loathsome teenager, college students. <laughs> I, I, have, I have no sympathy for any of them. <laughs> I, th- I was surprised, I forget his name, but the guy that played Hunter uh, in Boy Meets World. Sean Hunter. Sean Hunter. Yeah, Sean Hunter. Yeah, uh, Ryder Strong. That's it. Yeah, uh, Ryder really... Strong from, from, from uh, what was that, Boy Meets World? Yeah, yep. I don't really see yeah. anything <laughs> anymore. Um, I'd love to know how you got started working with uh, Death Set Press, because uh, your redemption, that wasn't the very first thing that you did with them. Yeah, um, um, uh, it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, Jeff Strand is the one who introduced us. Um, oh. He is, and I... I... Oh shit. Uh, Kenzie, I, I just muted you by mistake. I'm sorry. I meant to mute myself. I'm, sorry I'm so about sorry that. about that. That was my fault. <laughs> I cut that part out. Sorry. All right. So Jeff Strand, go ahead. Yeah. He is, he's my mentor. I, I credit him to be my mentor. Um, we had met at a horror convention in Orlando, Spooky Empire. And I, I just met him as a fan. I didn't meet him like as a writer, you know, a writer to writer or anything like that. And my boyfriend at the time befriended him. I'm getting to Death Press, don't worry, I am. Um, <laughs> and um, I got pissed at my boyfriend at the time he, because he befriended him and I was still the fan. He had his phone number and I didn't and I was so en- envious of that. And um, I had written a novel, a chiclet novel, chiclet superhero novel. And I had Jeff read it and he enjoyed it, but he didn't know, like he couldn't give me any advice because that's not his genre. You know, he couldn't do anything. And um, around that time, I was going through um, some real, real horrible stuff. Um, you know, my mother, my mother had died and, um, and it was a few years later, I, I wanted to write something that was about something I was experiencing, um, benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome, which is placed heavily in reception. And um, so I, I wrote a horror novel, I wrote reception and Jeff read it and he loved it and he said, you need to go to a convention, a writer's core writer's convention, but you need to go to some, a, a small one, a more intimate one, nothing like StokerCon or STC. Um, but yeah, something like, and he suggested KillerCon. And he said, this is what he said. He said, um, there is a publisher there who is, who is I'm, I'm writing a short story for their anthology. It was at Health and Hell Followed. And he said, I'm going to meet with them. And um, I told them that I will accept their, their, you know, their, their payment as long as they take me and my friend out to dinner. And the, the, here's the thing. It, it's in, it was in Austin. And he's, he had picked out the, the place they were going to take us, which was this barbecue place. And I, I, that's where I met Patrick and Jared. Mm-hmm. And um, the barbecue was absolutely awful. I mean, it was like the, most, the driest, nastiest stuff. It was so gross. And the potato salad had mustard in it. I mean, it was just, everything was wrong and backwards. It was just bad. And Jeff was kind of like, oh, well, crap, you know. <laughs> but at the time I, I pitched my book then and they were interested. And so I sent it when I got back and within a couple of months they accepted it. And that was, that's the story of Death's Head Press. And I have, uh, you know, been friends with, with Jared and Patrick and 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 worked with them on on several things so yeah uh, from here. <laughs> I, I don't know how this same thing with like ken mckinley and silver sharon i don't know how but I, I saw them when they got their first mythologies out and uh jared and patrick are awesome um real quick story that i can relate to a book that you got in dig two graves um i submitted a story to that it got rejected but i asked pat <laughs> why uh it got rejected just curious and 
he took the time to tell me. And that's the first time a, a publisher did that. And that was, I don't know, what, three, four years ago. And I don't, you know, you never forget when someone does that because a lot of people don't. Um, and Jared, I texted him and asked, do you have a question for Kenzie? And he said, <laughs> he said, ask her if she were a Smurf, which Smurf would she be? Smurfette does not count. I don't know if that's an inside joke. <laughs> I don't know. Um, whichever one was the lazy one who slept all the time. I don't know their <laughs> names. I just know them all by Smurf. There no, we go. That's a dwarf, and I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I, I think there was a lazy one. So that the lazy one, of course. I love There's it. always a lazy one. There the is. one that likes naps. <laughs> I mean, go on. <laughs> yeah, so, I was gonna say going back to Patrick. Yes. Um, he is, he's a writer and I always, I'm going to say something controversial in the writing world in general, is that I, I don't think that many writers make good editors. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it's, it's not that they don't have a grasp of language. They do. It's a great grasp of language, but they want to incorporate ideas of their own into somebody else's work. And Patrick was not that way at all. And he's a writer. And I was really, it was refreshing when he uh, worked on Red Station um, to get his notes. So I, I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> pleasantly surprised. He wasn't the editor for reception. That, that I, I'm not sure who edited that, but that, that there were problems with that. We won't get into that. And I, you know, the funny thing is, is that I didn't really know how many problems there were with the paperback until I worked with Thunderstorm. That was going to be my follow-up question when you worked with Paul, which we had him on last week with Ron Kelly. And um, he talked about reception and he messed up. Sorry, throwing him under the bus with me. I called it redemption. <laughs> Brendan Kindly texted me telling me it's reception. Thank you, sir. And uh, Paul called it redemption too. I'm only telling you that because it's, done. it's in the episode. Well, so, I was like, okay, what are they getting redemption for? Let me think. I don't yeah. know. I can't really, I can't really <laughs> make that. So, <laughs> set it a wedding reception. So, just to be clear, because I messed up the first time, so I'm like cling on to redemption as opposed to the right word, reception. So, working so with you had Paul, to throw a guest under the bus. Oh boy, <laughs> this show well, is done. <laughs> well, we've, we've criticized writers as editors. We've criticized, oh yeah. Jared and and Paul and <laughs> just to be clear, I I do love Paul, um, yeah. but he's coming out of the. <laughs> True. Anybody else want to say anything to get us canceled? Or... <laughs> <laughs> so working with Paul, how was that? Oh, it was great. Uh, no, seriously, he. I met him at Scares That Care. Jeff introduced us. He's he's the well. If the the um, hardcover reception was um, sort of a, a family affair. So Jeff did the, he did the, he did the foreword. He did it for the paperback too. Um, and Lynn did, did the cover. So oh, it was, awesome. and so all three of us were on the, the signature. He was nice. And um, the, the, the man who was, I can't remember who it was. And for, please, if he's watching, forgive me. I don't remember who is, what his name was. But the man who was in charge of the editing did, did a great job too. But that was what I was saying. Going back and seeing those mistakes, going, oh shit, I didn't catch that <laughs> for the paperback, you know. <laughs> and I'm an English professor. You're like, ah, this is why writers shouldn't be editors. So. Exactly. No, I agree with you. That's that's a fair point. Um, and Lynn, I met her at Scares of Care this year. I love her. She's like one of the first people that I met. Um, that well, I met the Kim McKinley, Kenneth Kane, and Todd Keeslin first, but like mm -hmm. one of the people outside of my close friend close circle of friends was her she's just a delight i uh such a doll. I, yeah. I, I really i i feel comfortable with her you know it's yeah. just easy easy to to talk to her yeah. i bought that cover for a weird magazine uh weird tale weird magazine. tales oh i know yeah and um i was like i have to have this and jeff was very friendly too so yeah i can't, I can't remember the cover she did there was one cover um, where it looked like a, a person's face and it was like an apple peeling. And oh, it was so good. I said Michael Siska, but I don't know if that's right. I could be way off. Base. You know what I'm talking about, though. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I saw the guy's wearing like a bowler hat. Um, that's, yeah, her, her art's incredible. She's one of my favorite artists. Uh, Brennan, do you have any questions pertaining to the genesis of Kenzie and... Uh, Pat and Jared meeting and the genesis of Kenzie. Okay, <laughs> that'd, that'd, be, that'd be going back. Um, 
So uh, actually, we, we, we mentioned reception and, you know, you starting to work with Death's Head and uh, not really a question, but I mean, just it, it, it's worth offering you a congratulations at having these two books out in, in the genre and having both of them uh, having been nominated for Splatterpunk Awards. Um, that's, that's just really cool, you know, even to just get the nod and to be two for two on that, you know, to make those short lists. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> so, so let's go to Red Station because mm-hmm. you know you you developed that relationship with Death's Head Press, and then um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was Patrick's idea to kind of start the Splatter Western line, um, and he approached you. And tell us a little bit about that. Um, he approached. How many of us were there um, initially? I think there was were seven or eight. I, I don't want to. I mean, obviously there's a lot more now, but, but um, because everybody sort of jumped onto it, said, oh, this is awesome. Um, and that was because the first book was so good. I mean, Wiley's book was amazing. Um, but yeah, he sent me a, an email um, kind of pitching the idea and, and asking if I wanted to join in. And the first thing I am now, I've now become a, a writer who is, I'm going to try as many different genres as I can. You know, and I, and I, and I, I want to try it out. And the problem with the, the Western is that I didn't like Westerns. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm, but I was, I was, I was honored because I'm a woman and, and it's such a masculine genre. Um, I mean, I hate to say that, but that, that is the case. Um, even though there are Westerns involving women in it too. And so I, I want, so I wanted to do like, I, I was kind of nervous about it, when he asked me, but I said, yes, I, I'll do it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely, I want to sign me up. Um, and it was supposed to be also a novella rather than a novel. Um, and the weird part is when they all came out that there were certain people who were writing novels. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, whatever. But you know, my, my, I stuck with it. I said, no, novella. And I had no idea what to write about. You know, I, it was like, okay, how many cowboys coming to town, you know, gunfights and shit like that. Yeah. How many times do we have to see that? And, it, or, well, okay, let's have the Sharon Stone character coming into town and, and shooting up everybody. I don't know, what was that name of that movie? The Sam Raimi one, the Western? I can't remember. Um, but yeah, um, the same but anyway. we <laughs> Yeah, I am sorry, I'm going off topic. But I, I didn't want to tell a story that was so typical of a Western. So I, uh, I, of course, I, I'm a researcher, you know, in academia, just, just what we do. Um, and of course, writers too, in general. Um, and I was researching just, I, I stupidly entered in things like terrible things that have happened in the West. <laughs> you know, terrible things, like, you know, my searches were just crazy like that. And I glommed onto a, uh, the story of the Bloody Benders, the, the, serial, the serial killer family in Kansas who um, murdered, they, were, they ran a station home and they murdered the people who were staying there and brutally murdered them. They, they'd hit them on the back of the head with a stone hammer and slash open their throats and then steal everything. And I said, oh my God, okay, well, what if I did something around that and had them kind of as the villains? And I thought, why don't I write a slasher in a Western? And I said, I am going to keep, I'm going to put tropes in there that people are familiar with. Um, and then I'm going to also put, uh, use them as the potential characters for the villains, um, but never say it. That's the, the implication is there. And I put in a lot of little Easter eggs for people who love that history. Um, and um, and then add characters that we see in, in slashers and, and my the character that is getting so much attention with this book um, is the lady in red, Clyde Morton. <laughs> Everybody freaking loves her. And I, I'm glad because I, I, I was like, oh my God, I just need to write something about her one day, you know, because this is just exploding. So she was my final girl to start with. And then she just became this woman with her own history and badassery, and but she's still a lady. I mean, so it just evolved into that. Um, <laughs> And so, but arguably I had a story in a Western setting with a stagecoach, with, you know, a driver and, uh, you know, the, the shotgun, I mean, all of the conventions for Western and then all the conventions for slasher. 
um, and slightly with a feminist bent. So that was it. That was, and and they liked it. So <laughs> win win. All right. <laughs> How's the reception been overall from when you? I mean, we kind of covered it, but was that a pun or? How's the redemption <laughs> the reception. then? Redemption, you mean? I, I said reception. <laughs> I know that was the joke, man. <laughs> oh no, I got it. Sorry, I'm slow. Haha. -ha. How's the reception been <laughs> on Red Station? Um, very good. Yeah, you know, people. I mean, more so than reception, which is, uh, I think it's kind of awesome and heartbreaking at the same time because reception is my personal story. But um, but Red Station was my frivolous. Let me see if I can write a Western story. <laughs> <laughs> but it spans um, all of this kind of interest. In, I got interested in researching again, which was really cool, you know, because I had been really burnt out with, with higher ed and, you know, researching shit for my work. <laughs> and and it, this was just so, this was freeing and fun. Um, the tricky part was, was um, I don't know if you guys ever wrote a historical fiction before, but um, it's hard. It's a pain yeah. in the ass. Because um, there's just, you have to research everything. I'm not just talking about, you know, the stagecoach, you know, what makes up a stagecoach? What's, what's the lady in red? What's her dress like? You have to research the language too. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it is tough. And I, I figured out a method to do it. The way to do it is to draft your story. Just go ahead and do it and, and use your common sense and then highlight the passages you're unsure of and go back when you're editing it to fix it and make it authentic. Um, yep. And so it became fun. And now right. that I know how to do it, I can write a sequel that people seem to want. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm going to write her story. I promise. So yeah. That's exciting to know. I'm, I'm so happy to hear you say that because I, I, I'm currently writing a story that takes place in about 1890. And that is exactly how I'm doing it using the, uh, uh, the Brian Keene, George Washington method. And if you don't know what that is, basically means every time you hit something that you're not sure about, you know, the historical accuracy of, you just write George Washington or something similar in capital letters so that it grabs your attention when you're doing edits. And yeah, yeah, you know, I'm because you can get stuck on that. You know, you, you want to get a little bit of story down and you spend an hour, uh, you know, like, well, Rabbit hole. They, they, yeah, they need to eat something. Uh, you know, what could they eat? What kind of container would that come in? Did that exist then? How would they cook that? You know, are they too poor to have a stove? Fuck it, they're cooking over the hearth. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. And and in the back of your mind, you know you're doing this not for you. I mean, you want to be perfect, yep. but it's not for you. It's for the jerk head who's going to read it and say, well, actually. <laughs> And that's just it, because like 99% of your readership isn't going to really, you know, oh, okay, they cooked on the oven, fine. Oh, no, 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 you're, you're writing in 1892, ovens were not invented till 1895. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So you are trying to do this for yourself, but appease, quiet down that, that lovely person yeah. who wants yep. to make that comment. Yeah. I'm a... Yeah, uh... we... We, we can add the well actually guy to our list of enemies made on this show. Great. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm working on a splatter punk Western specifically for Silver Shamrocks anthology that is open till April, April of 2022. Brennan, help me out. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. Let's go with that. <laughs> Who knows? Add Kent to the list. Um, but I'm working on that and I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's my method. I'm like, I'll just I'll just figure that shit out later. Yeah. And then, and then for my debut novel, maybe I'm an idiot because this is not going to be a short one. I'm working on a, a soldier that comes back from the Korean War. So the 1950s, uh, I'm just calling my mom, ask her a shitload of questions. And <laughs> I'm writing about my grandfather in Korea when he was teaching a, a Korean boy English. And I'm like, this sounds awesome, but what am I doing? <laughs> you want it accurate. You want it to be well re represented. You want, yeah. And it's, it's that voice. Yeah. So, so what was that? The phrase George Washington, what I'm trying to. So uh, he, he mentioned, Brian mentioned on um, some interview at one point that when he's writing 
Um, I, I want to say it had to do with historical accuracy, but honestly, it could have been just, you know, fill in the details. He would type George Washington in all capital letters. So when he was rereading, he would come across it and be like, ah, I need to do research here. Um, you know, I that need would to fill really, in the that would, that would still cause a lot of like, I, I mean, it's, it's clever, but you'd still have to go back and erase it. So like highlighting is better. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he did that also no so he, to brian king because i really like him but you know highlight it <laughs> it would um it, it's kind of what you said kenzie it's so he wouldn't go online to look for what the answer is and then oh what's this youtube twitter and get distracted yeah. and not right, right. <laughs> yeah. truth truth be told my version of george washington is just parentheses with a question mark in there so yeah yeah <laughs> um so you know Patrick mentioned that uh, Silver Shamrock is looking for, you know, splatter Western shorts for the next Midnight Anthology. I bet there's a lot of people who are going to check out this episode who wouldn't mind a short Clyde Northway story. Um, you know, just put oh. that bug in there. <laughs> oh, I did not. Be Wait, that no, makes perfect actually, sense. I, um, the, the original intent was like, um, I think it was, I don't want to like throw a publisher under the, under the gun here. Um, but I thought that there was another anthology coming out with Death's Head Press, but I'm not sure. There was talk of it and I'm not sure. So, and cool. somebody said to me, um, you should do that. You should write about her. And I'm like, I had a story, but it's grown. It's so big. I'm like, I, there's no way I could tell a short story about this woman. Uh, there's just no way. So I would love to do a Clyde Northway short story, but it just is too, it's too short. Yeah. <laughs> just, a, just a vignette um while we are talking about the character uh steph at steph horror mama sent in she wants to know she said she loved the red lady in that in that book and she would like to know if that character was based off uh anybody you know in full in part in any way shape or form um i'd be lying if i said no because she has per a different characteristics that are from all of the women in my life so i mean she's multi-dimensional um and she's classy she's educated she's funny she's uh, she's sharp she's um graciously honestly yeah so i just took all of the things that i i i love about my women friends and family and just put them i said i want to make this I don't want to say Mary, Mary Sue, but she's not a Mary Sue at all, but I want to turn this into the, an embodiment of some sort. And I, it, she, that's how, that's what she became. Um, but most of all, I wanted, this was the test. When my friends and fam, female family members read it, did they love her? And they all did. So I said, mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was the test. So yes, in a way, yes, 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 Steph. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I got one more question for the day, and it's it's from TJ Tranchel. I don't know if I said his last name right. I hope we did. So Kenzie, can you tell us in your own words why you kick so much ass? So that kind of goes <laughs> along with the character. <laughs> yeah, TJ and I joke on on Twitter. Um, I don't know why I kick ass. I think, I don't know. I think when he was typing that, he, it, was, it was under questionable circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> I don't answer. do that. <laughs> um, I only got one more question about Red Station because it's not a super long book, so we don't want to spoil it, but the cover art, uh, t Justin T. Coons. What do you think of this? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Um, I was the one. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I worked with him on it. So, I mean, yeah, I love it. What do I think of it? <laughs> I don't, you I didn't know if that would lead to deeper. I didn't know I, if that would lead to really, anything. I'd yeah, love uh, to know about the process of working on it. You know, how much uh, input did you give Justin versus, what? you know, him? Yeah. I, um, I gave more input to, to Lynn and I, I gave more input to her because she has a process that's like that. Justin is more of, this is how I see it. This is what I'm looking for, you know, I, I, I think. And he, he had, um, he had the, the, the center point, the, 
the evil woman, Mrs. Adler, whose face is in the in the middle, the, the creepy ass face. Um, and that's the moment where she she gets it. <laughs> and uh, not to give it anyway, though. Um, and it was a matter of balancing it out. And of course, the house had to be in the background and 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 the barn and whatnot. And it had to be dark. So it's what it's the probably the only one besides Chris's that's kind of visually dark looking. It's not so bright. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a matter of the women. And I said, well, Clyde has to be on there. I'm sorry, but she does. And, and so the lady in red and, and I said, and don't forget to put her, her little secret on her, you know, put her thing on her arm as well. So we, we got into that and it was a matter of balancing out with the other one, with the other person. It, and I said, they have, they have to be all women, even though there are men in the story. And I took one, I had him, I said, you know, there is another character, uh, a mute, there's a mute helper who may or may not be the daughter. It, it's kind of a weird, I can't go into detail because it's a lot of these weird little plot devices and twists and whatnot. Um, and she has a, like her mouth is um, melded into the other mouth. So she's, her lips are like that. So she can't really talk properly. And you, you, you'll get to, when you read the book, you, you find out what, why that is. Um, and, and she's kind of a lethal presence too. She's a little thing. And I said, just have her balance it out. And I gave the section in the book that describes her and he took that and just, he, he painted her exactly as I pictured her. So it was like, perfect. So that was That's it. Awesome. But yeah, it wasn't like Lynn's process. She's very interesting. She says she has you pick out uh, three covers that you really like, like three book covers that really have, have you drawn to them. And then um, we go from there, you know, we kind of, she, we, she comes up with, with an idea and then we, we kind of bounce ideas back and forth. And hers is a lot more back and forth. Justin's was, I've got an idea here. Here's what I have. What do you think I should add to it? So, <laughs> I mean, and that was my, my experience with Justin. I don't know what he did with the other authors. You know, I don't. I don't know what their experience was, but but he reach he reaches out. I mean, he he talks to us. So, yeah, that's great. That's um, awesome. And we should mention that now, as of I don't know when this came out. You posted it July third. Uh, Red stations in audio book format. That's pretty awesome. Is there yep. anything at all that you want to talk about pertaining to that? Um, the audio book. Um, yeah, I, not really, I'm not an audiobook fan, but you know, for people who like it, it's, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm partial. I mean, no, no offense to the, to the audiobook of Red Station, but I'm really partial to reception because I got to pick this woman out mm. for reception. It was awesome. I, I, I worked with fire, I worked with Fireside on that one for the oh, audiobook. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Death Head Press did the, did the audiobook for this, for Red western because it's their series so yeah. sense. brian why don't you lead the way with the next topic sir i i, I want to throw one more thing in about red station before we move on um now i've read I, I i won't pretend i've gotten through the whole series there's a lot of them and they seem to come out you know very very rapid fire um but I've read a lot of them, and it seems like this is probably the only one that doesn't have like a head blowing up or something just awful and gory happening. Or it, it, it has kind of a um, I don't want to say a slower start because that sounds that sounds rude. But it, the first half of it is very uh, is a lot of build up. So when when you were told, you know, kind of the I guess idea behind the splatter and western splatter western series. Um, what was your method, I suppose, for kind of building this one where it just, it just kind of, uh, escalates and escalates as it goes. And we really get to know the characters a little bit more than one might expect in a book like this. Um, that's my, but that's my process in general. I, 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 my view of storytelling is, is I like good characters. I think above all, I like good characters. I did not approach this book or reception or any of the short stories or anything else or upcoming stuff with the intent. Oh, I'm just gonna write gory scenes. I'm gonna just throw all kinds of gore and shit all over the place. I'm not gonna do that. 
Um, so my process is, yeah, I want people to get to know the characters and like them, which is essential for me. After talking about hostile and cabin fever, you know this, this is essential for me. You gotta like the characters. And um, so when that horrible shit happens, the gore comes out. I mean, it's, it's, it's splattery and disgusting. Um, I want it to be shocking. Um, I want characters that you thought were going to be okay. I want them destroyed. You know, I want you to have your heart ripped out. I do. Um, and I want, of course, I want you to root for the protagonist, you know, the protagonist, of course. Um, even though she has to struggle too, because she's human, but yeah, that's my process. And no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to follow anybody else's pattern. You know, like, like Chris Triana just goes right into it. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm not, I, I love his stuff. I love, I told him, I said, full brutal is like one of my favorite splatter, you know, extreme horror books. I love that book. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not going to just immediately, although the first scene in, in Red Station is gory, but it's not, you don't know what's happening. Um, afterwards, yeah, you have to get to know the characters. Otherwise, what is the point? Yeah. What is the point? Agreed. Is there, <laughs> is there an author or authors that for you, Kenzie, that um, really strikes character-driven uh, yeah, approaches? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, Jeff Jeff is one of them. He he does that. Um, he's very um, because he's more humor based. He likes to write characters that we under that we have we know like modern with snappy kind of funny dialogue and and he's one who does that. Um, Jack Ketchum is another one who is mm -hmm. a, a great. Uh, he was a great character builder. Um, I'm thinking a lot of his his book Red was that about the dog. Yeah. And and the girl next door, of course, um, yeah. but, which was also based on a true story. So yeah, true case. But um, um, those are the ones. Those are two who who immediately come to mind. But you know, I the more I think about it, I I think Adam Neville's another one too. But he also likes atmosphere and setting. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I I, I can't wait for nobody gets out alive. I can't wait for that movie to come on. It's coming on this month. I'm like, oh my god, it's my Is that favorite. Netflix. Uh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Um, and it's such a good haunted house movie. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm book, and I'm like, oh god, I hope it's a good movie. But anyway, yeah. So um, all of the books that I that I have enjoyed, all the horror novels that I've enjoyed, have all been character based, and the, and it, and they've all kind of they're creepy things that happen, but they take their time, you know. Um, yeah. And they do, they don't rush it. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't really, I'm, that's, I'm not fond of jumping right in and just going like full throttle the whole way through, you know? <laughs> I'm right there with you. It's a preference thing. It's not a, um, I had a guy, you know, it's funny you say that, Brennan, because I had a guy, um, this, this guy, I, he's a friend of mine. And he, one of the first things he said to me for reception is that it reminded him of an A24 movie. <laughs> and I, I didn't know how to take that. I was like, I like A24, so it was like a compliment to me, but other people would be like, oh. They're like, one of. The Witch and, you know, Hereditary and like, it's like starts out really slow and builds. And I said, I looked at him and I said, well, yeah. <laughs> so. I, I think The Witch is a, a masterpiece. Um, oh, yeah. I, I fucking love that movie. I've only seen it twice, but it's just, it's so good. It's so creepy. And it doesn't, it doesn't throw you right into freaking horror. It just takes its time. It's a neat approach. <laughs> it's a neat approach. And I'm like the early uh, colonists back there too. But I just want to say for me, right off the bat, character-driven authors is definitely Sam Koyesnik. Um, Brent, I just read her second book that's coming out soon. And and she like long fiction or short fiction, she always does it. And look at her uh, her publishing company off limits press i mean it's all oh character yeah, driven yeah. Based stories. i didn't catch the name uh, sam of course yeah samantha koyasnik sorry yeah. about that yeah i i i i uh I, i've worked with her a couple of times already yep. um, when she was um the science fiction editor for five on the fifth i had my first oh, i didn't know that i I thought you were going to be talking about uh, the Grindhouse anthology. So, uh, no, so well, I was, uh, you know, I, I, that was the second time. The first time, though, was a science fiction story. And okay. um, that was my, the only science fiction story I ever wrote. And, uh, and I wrote it, like, during a, during, like, in the middle of these stupid, like, um, work 
meetings <laughs> to attend. So she, she was my first experience in dealing with an editor in a genre I hadn't touched before. So, and, and I liked working with her. And so, yeah, getting, getting into uh, um, having a story in Worst Laid Plans was, was a lot of fun. It was fun working with her again. Yeah, well, yeah sure. Brennan, before I move on, is there anything that you want to bring up? Me? No, go for it. Uh, Bre Brennan. Um, okay, so. No more mumbling. Am I mumbling? No, I think you're okay. Okay. Well, I'm, <laughs> if I am, let me know. You have notes. Is that notes? Are you taking notes? Yeah. Yeah. I'm right. Like right now, I'm writing down the time. So I cut this part out and I'm writing down people that you mentioned just to tag them, just early hype for the episode. Um, what was I going to ask next? <laughs> uh, damn it. I'm having a brain fart. That's okay. I'll go. go ahead. Um, Kenzie, I saw you post pretty recently, uh, possibly even today. I don't, I don't know about um, watching, you know, other people post about how much work they're getting done and kind of feeling shame about not living up to that. I hear that. So <laughs> I was, I was kind of hoping you'd talk about, I guess, pretty much anything you want on this subject, but about balancing just life with writing. Um, I posted that while I was in the middle of grading hell. Oh no. Um, and obviously, and I get, I get really frustrated during the busiest. It seems like, I don't know about you guys noticed this, but it seems like, like fall, I, it's gotta be a Halloween thing. It's like the big time summer and fall are when publishers put out stuff, writers are getting acceptances. And I'm like, I, I, and I, I looked back, I got so depressed because I, I hardly did anything this year. Like I did so much in like 2018 and 19, actually no, 19 and 20 and nothing of <laughs> notes. I have one story coming out at the end of the year in um, Uncomfortably Dark's The Baker's Dozen collection. Is that okay? And, um, and I have like, I'm, I'm also one of the, I'm working on something for Slash Her with um, Kendisha and nice. uh, um, um, those, those ladies with Kendisha um, and Janine and Jill. I was like, oh, their names. I know them. I talked to them. We love Janine and Jill, yeah. <laughs> yep. Janine and Jill. Um, JJ. JJ. Um, <laughs> JJ. Yeah, so I got super depressed when I saw that, but it happens every year. It's not like... Um, I get jealous because I can't concentrate. I can't focus on writing um, because I'm, I'm, I'm reading all day long. I'm helping somebody who cannot write at all, oh, how to, God. you know, how to form co coherent sentences. Um, and it's just, it's draining. And the, there's one person I've talked to who, who completely empathized and that's Regina Garza, Garza Mitchell who wrote, who wrote Shadow of the Vulture. Okay. Um, she is she is big in higher ed. She's a scholar, she is, um, and she teaches also teaches I think at a community college too, but I'm not sure. But she's she's uh, got all these academic publications and whatnot, and she just she emailed me and basically said I know exactly what you're going through. I can't. I'm drained by the time the day is over. I don't know how people write. You know, I don't know how they do that. So it's just it's total like envy. <laughs> It's writer envy. And it's something that I'm trying to work on with myself to stop feeling so envious of people who have that, that all that time they can come home and just write, mm -hmm. you know, from their job and just write. And I'm like, <laughs> just, I'm so envious of that. Um, and I, you know, and, and so I probably need more um, push, more, more people, more, more of people like Gina to, to say, I empathize with you. I know we need to do something about it, that kind of thing. But, uh, but do you ever feel like that? I mean, I lost my, t I lost my free time to write after work when I had a son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have adorable, you have adorable son. He's oh, thank you. So cute. Um, but yeah, I was thinking the the parenthood is probably, I, I'm thinking about Wesley Southard right now, who is going to be a dad. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and, yes. um, I'm like, I, 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 he will, he will write. Um, I have no, no, I, complete confidence he's going to be fine with that but being able to to travel and do the things he usually do, does I'm like oh 
Maybe they'll bring yeah. the baby. Maybe they'll come together. You know, he is. He's always at a con. <laughs> yeah, he's got like a. He always has a full plate. I'm, I'm so impressed mm-hmm. with him. Like yeah, I learned so much from him. He was also one of the first people at Scares that I met, and he said he was running through the list to me and McKinley about where he's been, and he listed like I'm pretty sure 13 to 20 places before Scares. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it was yeah. All over the damn place. And he and it's like him and who was it? Who else was it? Chris and Lucas Magnum. And I mean, they're all like posting their, I'm going to be at all of these conventions, <laughs> like 27. <laughs> Just like, And then they're like, oh, one's been canceled. Oh, well, I'm going to do this one. <laughs> you know, I was really excited for this weekend because my wife, <laughs> this kind of sound awful at first. Just listen through the whole thing. My wife was going to be uh, at her girlfriend's bachelorette party and my son was going to be with my mother-in-law for most of Saturday and Friday, but it ended up being, uh, he got sick. He, uh, my mother-in-law had to go to, yeah, she's fine now. And um, he threw up more times than I ever can, can remember. So I, uh, I didn't really read and I didn't write. And uh, that's the kind of thing you, that I, I experienced from time to time. I can't write a whole lot now. So I, I, I've written half of a 6,000 word Spider Western in two months. So I empathize very well, much good. with you. Yeah, uh, I, thank I, you. I, the trick is, I, I, you know, I, I know because I've been given this advice many times before. The trick is to never compare yourself to somebody else. Yeah. We know this, right? But we do. Yeah. We can't yeah. help it. Oh, yeah. Um, but that's, I, I, you have written more than me in two months. Oh, wow. Lansdale <laughs> well, said what? I have. Excuse me. <laughs> I just want to throw this in there and then jump in, Brendan. Lansdale gave me advice because I reached out to him and because I was feeling really super down. I was on Twitter too much, just like looking at everyone's. Yeah, that's another thing. Get off social media. But I, I reached out to him because he's a no, not that he's the only one, but he's a no bullshit guy that's done it all. So I, I just asked for his advice and uh, about writing. Long story short, he said that um, try one sentence a day until it grows. And I'm like, that's smart. So, you know, I was going to say, Kenzie, I feel like you kind of have the deck stacked against you because your, your day is words, 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 but it's other people's. And then by the time you sit down to, you know, do your own thing, you're burned out. Um, my day job is I'm a music teacher. And, you know, 13, 14 years ago when I was going to school for it and doing observations, I worked with a middle school music teacher And he told me, he said, you know, his summer job is he picks up um, golf balls off a driving range. He said, and he said, it's mindless. And, you know, I just need to do something that's not music. And, you know, at the time I was like, I love music. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to teach during the day. I'll do piano lessons at night. But it's when, when you, you know, no matter how much you enjoy something, no matter how much a passion it is of yours, if you do it for 12 hours a day, every day, it's numbing. You know, whereas I can get burned out on something like that. And I, I find that writing is a nice escape at night. But uh, again, I'm, you know, I don't have anything useful to offer you. I just, I feel, I, I, I get it, you know? And like you said, we, we compare ourselves to people. Everybody has at least, you know, a couple friends who are the, you know, three times a week, I got accepted here. I got accepted there. I got, I got accepted everywhere i've got 100 percent success rate yep. it um, sounds like you're talking about Haley piper because that man that girl's oh, getting really? accepted everywhere yeah it's like a publishing like like gene there's something like some kind of spark in her she's just everywhere she just got yeah. accepted into uh agora it's um agora and uh polis are books. you thinking polis yes yeah. well agora is a part of it i forget which one's the imprint Yep. You know, um, I wanted to say Albert Einstein, he was a patent clerk. And uh, when he was doing that, because that was mindless, not that this helps you, Kenzie, but he would just, that's where he thought of a lot of his theories and, and uh, where he came up with a lot of his papers while I was at his day job. Um, yeah, that, that can't happen. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't really know how. Uh, um, well, well, like I said, I wrote a science fiction story during, during some faculty meetings. So, I mean, it is possible. <laughs> Like the meet the useless meetings. <laughs> just, 
It could have been an email meetings, you know, where you're sitting there for several hours, you know, Brennan, cause you're, you were a teacher or you are a teacher and I am, yep. you are, so you know, the useless faculty meetings sometimes. Oh, I had one today. It was useless. <laughs> totally useless. Could have been an email. Yeah. I have two meetings this week and I am not looking forward to either one of them. So <laughs> I, I got to tell you, you know, just because you'll get a kick out of this, but um, I, I sat through an hour long meeting about uh, updates to the evaluation process. And as we have been talking, I have been getting emails that are literally just the PowerPoint slides I saw at the faculty <laughs> meeting. You know, it's so, I mean, you there's... That because I just had my, I had my Canvas notifications are on my phone because obviously because a lot of, a lot of my classes are virtual right now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I like I've had like five messages pop up on Canvas, one of them from my boss. So, you know, yeah. like, okay, what's going on? Nope. <laughs> it, it's, it's a whole new meaning of this could have been an email. It's, oh, it literally is an email, but you made right. me, you know, give up my afternoon anyway. Appreciate it. You guys right. ever have meetings on emails? Meetings about emails? Yeah. I have, get emails about those. <laughs> we have, I, I, I can tell you though, like faculty senate at the college, at my college where I work, they have like, it feels like a meeting that's live because they have these chain emails where two people are fighting and like, you know, two colleagues are like, why are we doing this? Blah, blah, blah. And it's just like a meeting. It's just like an mm -hmm. English faculty meeting, except through it's through email. So it is possible. It is, <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the part of the meeting I had today that wasn't observation based was, you know, the obligatory 10 minutes to the equity team, which not to, you know, not, not to poo poo that obviously, you know, equity is super duper important, but the slideshow was literally just memes. And <laughs> I mean that literally memes like, you know, here's a funny picture about how equity is, you know, interpreted by, you know, whatever group. Uh, here is a funny picture about what equity actually means. It's like, we've seen these. We all have the internet. I know. Why are you doing this? Well, they're trying to be trendy. It's that that edutainment aspect. So yeah. what we're doing, where the, the boomers and the, I, I'm going to say I'm a Gen Xer, they think they're being clever. <laughs> So you'll have a, a meeting consisting of memes, even though memes are so 2010. <laughs> Sounds like Michael no, Scott's you. your boss. <laughs> Michael Scott is all of our bosses. That's why that show was so popular. <laughs> they try too hard and it and fail, you know, just fail. And then it's even worse, you know, because they'll have the meme, the meeting like that where they have they think they're being cool with all of that. And then you'll have the old codgers who've been in this school for like 30 years going, well, I don't understand it. Could you, ref <laughs> could you just tell us what's going on? You know, oh, adding another hour. But anyway, yes, the job is a giant time sec. So very much. All right. So, I mean, the follow-up has to be when you do get a chance to write, you know, what kind of strategies, tactics, what, what, what do you throw at the wall to build up the confidence to get it done? I don't write what I'm supposed to do first. I, I you know, if I have like right now, I have, uh, you know, that I, I've been, that I have to do for, for Kendisha, for Slasher. And I've already started it. I started it some time ago. So and I know where it's going. So I'm not worried about it. But in order to get back into the groove, I'll I'll just write something for my my blog or something. You know, I won't I won't do anything that I'm gonna try to get a, an audience for. It's just personal. Like maybe it's a, a, a list of all of the movies I saw and what I thought of them, you know, for the past couple of months. And it's just for me. But that's just to get in the groove of writing again. I mean, never mind like what am I writing? It's like I have to. See if I can write after seeing so many things that were wrong with other people's writing. <laughs> That's my fear, Brennan. That is my fear is to, I, I'll be writing and I'm going to start writing like, like a student who can't write because <laughs> that's what I've been seeing nonstop. Like right before I got on here, I was looking at a paper and the whole essay the student is writing as if she was talking to me, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. you, you, you know this, you know that. And I, I, I'm just. <laughs> that's, that's, oh my God. That's, <laughs> you, that's a legitimate fear though, because, you know, I always say, you know, that 
the best way to learn how to write is to read a lot. And, you know, you, so you're absorbing the masters. If you're, if you're reading, you're absorbing people who really know what they're doing. But if you go, I never thought about this before, but it's so interesting. If you go the other way and you absorb people who are learning the craft, do you devolve? <laughs> oh <boy. laughs> Until you're a um, Neanderthal. You don't I, have to answer that, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I think I can. Yeah, you kind of do. Um, I, and so, again, you have to have a practice session before you start diving into it. But also what you said, you need to do the reverse right afterwards. You need to read something good when you get back into it. So, yeah, I have a stack of books on my nightstands and I'm going through them very slowly <laughs> just to say this is a good piece of writing. I'm reading this is terrible. The book I'm reading right now is a novella. It's The Final Gate by Wesley and Lucas. And um, it's, a, it's a, a tribute to the Fulci, the, the Gates of Hell stories, you know, like um, 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 The Beyond and The House by the Cemetery. And um, it's like their, their version of it. And it's a novella, but it's taking me a long time to read it because, because I've been reading stuff all day. But I'm enjoying it. It's great writing and it's paced well. And so I can, I can put it as, you know, finish a chapter and then pick it up and enjoy it. But that will get me back into good writing is by exactly what you said, by reading good writing afterwards. So yeah, if I started writing after I read this essay, no, it would not work. <laughs> Everything in second person, oh boy. Everything. <laughs> You knew what she meant. So let's move yep. on to Halloween questions because this is the very first episode to air in October. I'll just start out with it. What do you think about Halloween? <laughs> um, I love it. Um, I have mixed feelings about it in general here in Florida because I live in Florida. Um, and um, the pandemic's kind of changed a lot of stuff with Halloween. But um, I, when I am able to, I, I love taking part in it. I love the, the trick or treaters. I love looking at the kids in their costumes, you know, you know, and if the parents, if everybody's in costume, it's even better. Um, I love the ceremony of it. Um, it does not feel like Halloween in Florida though. It's like ridiculously hot and humid and disgusting. So, and it'll be that way. And it's hurricane season all the way to November 1st. So, you know. Um, uh, I, I have mixed feelings about Halloween, but generally I like it. So feel free to say pass on this, but East Coast or West Coast that you live on? Oh, I live in Florida, East Coast. <laughs> um, I meant the East or West Coast of Florida. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he going with this? No, that's true. okay. I've never heard it phrased like that. Uh, um, I guess I would go East because, Coast and Gulf. Yeah, I was like, well, I'm in Florida, so it's at the East it's in the <laughs> area. I yeah, sorry. Um, I, um, and that's also well, it's also confusing to me because I'm in this. I'm in Central Florida. Okay. Mm. So I'm not in by any either coast. I'm about the same amount of time to go. I'm literally, Winter Haven. I'm in Winter Haven, which is like right in the middle. And we are noted mainly for Legoland. Our town has Legoland. <laughs> so um, yeah, and 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 alligators and orange gro dead orange groves and meth. That's what oh. we're noted for. But Fantastic. yeah, so right in between. I only ask, and you know what? I think when I start. Oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I thought. No? Okay, that's just me. All good. Um, so I only started saying that because my folks are moving to the west side of Florida, or however you want to phrase it, and now they got me all screwed up when I'm talking about Florida. Dolph. Yeah, whatever. Dolph near, Dolph. They're, near, <laughs> they're going to be near St. Petersburg, so that's yep. how they, that's how they Jeff, word it. Jeff and Lynn live, used to live in Tampa, which is, you know, St. Petersburg's neighbor, so. Oh, okay. And that's, and that's why we were able to meet, because, um, you know, it was like nothing. <laughs> So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, they don't live there anymore though. And now they live in Atlanta and now they're moving to Tennessee. Why are they going to Tennessee? Uh, I guess, but just better, better all around. Hmm. I, I don't, you know, who knows why people decide to do the things they yeah. do. That's true. <laughs> I live in New Jersey. I never even thought I'd drive through the state and I love it here now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of I my neighbors, uh, Tom Brady lives in Tampa Bay now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We, have a, we have a lot of athletes that live in, this, in Central Florida. We also have a lot of morons. 
Laura's on the news often. So what do you have a do you have a lot of <laughs> I'm getting myself all silly. Do you have uh any particular movies that you not necessarily have to, but really enjoy watching during uh, Halloween? Oh. Yeah, people do that, don't they? They like watch like, <laughs> marathons and stuff. I mean, I watch horror movies anyway. I don't really like it's not a special occasion for me. I'm just gonna like whatever's on. Um, um, no, I don't. I don't have a, a ritual of doing that. I will. I will watch a horror film, but it's not just for Halloween. So, I, but my, um, in terms of like what I like to watch, like, like I guess the you know you want the answer to be: Do you watch the Halloween movies on Halloween? <laughs> Which did right? That's what, and and uh, no, I don't watch those. Um, um, I am really looking forward to, and it's not during Halloween either. It's this month on Friday. Um, Midnight Mass is coming out on Netflix, mm. the Mike Flanagan series, and I can't yeah. wait. I love his stuff. <laughs> so really, I'm looking great. forward to that. But I, what comes out? What's coming out? Is is the new Halloween movie actually coming out next month? It's coming yeah. out. It's also on uh, the Peacock app. I think they opted to send the streaming. Yeah, I'm not getting <laughs> Peacock, and that's another streaming. Are you like me? Do you like? Oh, okay. Well, I'll get it for a little while. The free, the yeah. free time. You know, the free like week or so that you can have it, and then just to watch the movie and then cut it off. Yes. Well, I, I'll be honest. I have Peacock, and the reason I have it is because the children wanted to watch The Boss Baby too, and I forgot to cancel it. So <laughs> now we're going to watch Halloween Kills. <laughs> and that's how they get you. You forget to cancel. Forget, forget to cancel it. But now you can watch Halloween Kills. So exactly. And that 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 actually, I saw the new trailer today. I think this morning, um, and it looked pretty. It looks like fun. I mean, it looks like they're bringing a lot of people back from the original film. So that yeah. was really yeah. Cool. Yeah, I really liked it. Um, I also like Rob Zombies. There's a lot of remakes on Halloween. It's starting to compete with Spider-Man. <laughs> Is that coming out? What? What's what? What the hell horror movies besides Halloween Kills is coming out next month? Well, I you know, it real quick. I don't know. I don't know. Let look quickly. Let me just check the internet. Uh, well, well, well. Patrick surfs the interweb, so I mean, we we have to ask you this, but I'm. I'm going to sympathize with your answer or lack of answer because I always see these people posting their curated Halloween reads. This is what I will read in October. And I mean, my list is here's the people we're talking to and I've got more books than I can fit into a month, you know, so I'll, I'll just squeeze in what I can, but are there, are there any, uh, any books you would consider Halloween reads? Um, well, I mean, something wicked this way comes is my favorite Halloween read. Um, nice. I, I mean, that's, I, I love that novel, uh, or, or it's not really a novel, novella. Um, um, I think that's, you know, I, and of course, like, I, I think anything that is creepy, like, like we were talking about, like Adam, Adam Neville stuff would be really good to read during Halloween, haunted, haunted house movies. And, and since that movie is coming out at the end of September, that would be a good one to revisit. <laughs> so... I haven't read the reddening though, so I'll be curious. Maybe I should read that for Halloween. But I, I don't have any like like books to read for Halloween specifically. And mm -hmm. yes, you said you sympathize and you know that I, I am still reading papers until we we the term ends. So Yep. <laughs> so I mean your 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 answer is you know, when, when somebody says, What is your curated list of Halloween reads? Like whatever I can fit in right. my head, damn it. <laughs> That's right. Whatever, man. Um, I, I hope to finish the final gate before then, but the novella. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Wesley and Lucas. <laughs> it is a really good book, but it's like I am so tired. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few more. So it. it was a great chapter, but I'm going to bed. <laughs> There's we can few... thank them for putting uh, together such concise, you know, bite-sized chapters to right. fulfill your reading itch. And they did, and they really did. So with the cliffhangers, so it's good. It's good. <laughs> There's a few movies, uh, horror movies coming out in October, um, 2021. Uh, Last Night in Soho by Edgar Wright, director of Shaun of the Dead, comes out October 29th. Uh, Antlers comes out 29th of October. What, wasn't that a short story? Did some, who wrote that short story? Um, the Antlers. Was it? Um, I don't know. I, I, I want to mm. say. He, he's, doesn't he write for TV or something? 
Oh, I don't know. It's another one of those. I, you know, when you read an article really quickly and then you instantly forget about everything and you wish you could remember, that's, that's basically it. We're just absorbing so much data at one time, it's hard to remember everything. Yeah. Uh, the screenplay was written by C. Henry Chasen, Nick okay. Antosca. But what was, who, who wrote the story that was based uh, on? Nick Antosca. Oh, okay. So it, was he the guy who did Channel Zero? Oh, I don't know. I've, I've run out of. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like you guys. Uh, yes, he was. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And also, um, it looks like he was somehow involved in that brand new cherry flavor uh, show that everybody's yeah. talking about. Yes. I, I, I love that series that I love channel zero as well. Um, that surrealist, creepy, weird stuff was just, ugh. you know, it's like David Lynch and David Cronenberg and <laughs> All the David. So Lamb is coming all up. All the weirdos, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of A24, uh, Lamb is coming out October 8th. I'm kind of oh, yeah, this backwards. And then there's one more. Uh, there's someone, I don't know this one. There's someone inside your house, October 6th. Uh, it says another Netflix offering, a slasher film based on a novel of the same name. It's about a transfer student who finds herself in the center of some gruesome murder cases when she moves to a town in Nebraska to up the scare factor apparently the murderer at large wears a life life a life like mask of the victim's face whilst killing them oh that's fucked Ew. up yeah <laughs> yeah all right yeah and netflix is really getting on the horror train right now isn't i like it, it. yeah like so fear shutter. Movies? Yep. i didn't think i'd like the fear street movies because i don't i'm not a real rl stein fan mm -hmm. but uh but those 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 were a lot of fun i so let's jump to what are you re oh you know what i i just was told by a co-worker yesterday that um american horror story he's like you gotta check that out because me and brian yes. that I one that I, that the new one i don't like american horror story most often because it like goes off the rails mm -hmm. you're watching it and it's like got a single narrative and suddenly there are like 15 of them and, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. and i i i can't it's a ryan murphy thing um yeah when he's straightforward though, like this new season of American Horror Story, the one about the, it's a writer on the coast and it's kind of like Salem's Lot, there are vampires there. Um, the it, it's, actually good. it's actually pretty good. It's like, it stays the course. It doesn't go in like, yeah. what the hell is happening here? So, um, it, it, and I think that the that it, it's now going to pick up the second, it's like two parts. Like there's one story and then it's conjoined to another story. Oh, okay. And I think they stopped the first one and now they're moving into the next one. So. Yes, I was bringing that up because Brian and I go to the Cape uh, every now and then and uh, that's where it's based. So it sounds really neat. Mm -hmm. um, you guys so like we, American Horror Story? Uh, I like some of it. <laughs> All right. So I, I watched the first three seasons and I just, I could never really get into it. You know, I like horror and my wife was willing to watch the show, which typically she's not so i mean like it had all the ingredients for success and it still blew it so it like i couldn't get past it. what's that it's like schizophrenic i i, I just i couldn't get i, I think we started the circus one and i we couldn't i just didn't care that was a terrible <laughs> one and, and it was also they had the potential to make this fantastic villain with the guy horrible smile what, what was he called the what serial killer clown twisty? guy and maybe oh, twisty. twisty i think that's i think that's right i think this is yeah it. and they made him that they, they turn him into a sympathetic character and i'm like you have a monster just leave him a monster just take out the horror out of american horror story i mean come on yeah, <laughs> yeah i agree I don't stupid know. american story <laughs> stupid american horror american horror story <laughs> so what we kind of already covered this but uh you, you talked about what you're reading right now. Is there anything else that you're currently reading? Um, am I? Or have read recently that you'd like to plug? Yeah, yeah or recently. Not recently, no. That's a terrible thing for somebody who writes to say. No, I mean, like, I talked to Catriona Ward, for example, and she said she doesn't read while she's writing because uh, that kind of interrupts mm -hmm. her process. So oh, that that's makes a good point. My, 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 hers is a better like that's a real writer answer <laughs> I, I am reading too much every day <laughs> i don't want to read anything oh, um, makes sense. 
like I said, I, 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 I will read a book at a time. Like I said, I, I am reading, I, I'm reading the final gate and that's, that's the slowest I've ever been in with a book. <laughs> and it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's my doing. Um, I, there are so many that I do want to read. You know, I, I, I want to read more Haley Piper's stuff because I, I really like it. And um, yeah, and I can't wait for Sam's uh, book Waif to come out. I mean, that, mm. that'll be a great character. She's character too. She loves characters. So um, yeah, I, there are books that I, I, I want to read, but will I read them now? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Brian, what about you, man? Yep. You know, I, I got to put in real quick, one of my favorite real writer answers, as Kenzie put it, uh, that we've ever gotten on that question was Mark Steensland, who basically said he only reads um, like uh, books that are kind of related to his work in progress, so he can't talk about them. So, you know, it's, it's a very creative way to say, I'm not going to tell you. Um, <laughs> So I am reading uh, one book I'm in the middle of and really digging is uh, Tyler Jones has a new book coming out uh, sometime in October uh, called Almost Ruth. And his book Criterium was excellent. This one's a little bit longer um, and it kind of dives into small town. The best way I can think to put it is rituals. Um, things that, you know, would seem normal to all the people in, within a town. Uh, it's just the way things have always been, but from the outsider perspective, it's like, that's really weird. Um, and the way he kind of builds these rituals as tradition and, you know, um, the, they're so ingrained within the community and within the people, even though they're really just off-putting, um, he does oh, a so really good job. It's, it's like Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. You know, you know what's funny is I, I, you know, I agreed to read this, this book and, you know, uh, write a blurb for it. And that's exactly not The Lottery necessarily, but Shirley Jackson is an author that came to mind. Um, it has a Shirley, you know, and you, you saying that at my, uh, you know, meandering description of it uh makes me think that's the right way to go it, it's it has a shirley jackson quality to it so i'll straight i'll put that yeah, out there i was gonna say the, the one of the better books that i and this is a controversial book because it has so many different opinions one of the better books that i've read where it was a, a town like that that was immersed in something that was supernatural and it was part of their life and they had rituals and whatnot was hex um the the one about the witch who'd cursed the town and yeah, they can't, Thomas they can't something. Town. yeah it's thomas old i don't know how to pronounce his last name i i screw up people's names all the time and i don't want to do that um wasn't he like this wasn't he like 16 when he wrote that book all i know is that book blew up for him it, it it's so well constructed and i and i marvel from from what i if i'm if i'm not mistaken he was very young when he wrote it and um, he, he must, his process must have been like, he must have tried to predict every single logical question a reader would ask. Like, why doesn't the government know about this? Why did it, you know, all these little things. And he had an answer for everything. <laughs> um, and that's why I, it, it always stuck with me, but it, it sounds like that. It sounds like a lot yeah. like, like Hex and the lottery and that kind of thing. From, from page one, it does have, uh, I couldn't think of a better word to describe it than lore, um, but yeah, a, a way to kind of just describe why this town believes what they do and why they do the things they do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, now I'm going to lean into that Shirley Jackson angle. Uh, the other thing I'm reading is Sonora Taylor's Someone to Share My Nightmares With. That's a, um, free, that's a new uh, uh, advanced reader copy. Yeah, she, she's going to be with us for a spotlight episode about a month from now. Um, and she's going to do a reading probably from this book, but I won't, you know, nail her down to it. Um, she had a collection come out about uh, two years ago called Little Paranoias. And it's, yes. you know, to, to this day, it's one of my favorites. It's a great mix of poetry, flash, and longer pieces. Um, so I've been really looking forward to this one. And I'm about halfway through. It's great. And, you know, it's, I'm going to hold up the cover again for people on YouTube. Uh, if I could, if I had to like really pin down Sonora's writing, it would be that guy's going to fuck a skeleton. 
Like that's that's her genre. <laughs> that guy's gonna fuck a skeleton. Um, that's you need lube yeah, for I, that. I, I suppose so. <laughs> that's inappropriate. Um, so what am I reading? Okay, so I'm reading White Sands by Johan Thorson. I'm pretty sure that's how you say uh, his last name. He is what, what country is from? Uh, he's from Iceland. Uh, so I could be completely saying it incorrectly. But anyways, it's a story about a detective. He described it to me as the Silence of the Lambs. Um, I'm kind of getting that vibe right now, but it's kind of its own thing. It's a detective that he has a missing daughter, but that's not the main storyline. Uh, the main storyline is that there's these so far two, I'm 50 something percent in. So there's these two cases where it's these husbands that kill their wives, but it's not really them. It's a supernatural element sort of deal, but it, it's really interesting how he's adding all these different plots and connecting them. I'm starting to see some things connect. And um, I'm, a, I'm always marvel at authors who can do that, who have yeah. like multiple storylines and can bring them together. I'm the opposite. I'm such a simplistic storyteller. My characters <laughs> are complicated. My stories. Oh, it's a slasher in a in a station home. Okay, you know. <laughs> well, <Wow>. okay. <laughs> wasn't it Hemingway that was the one that had a more simplistic approach as of, as opposed to like uh, Fitzgerald? I think it was. Um, it, or, probably that would make sense. He was very Hemingway was very simple with his stories. Too. Yeah, I mean, and people kind of still like him. So you know, just saying, you know, people will probably still like Red Station. Uh, <laughs> That's your expiration date. Um, that's morbid. Uh, what that else? Is, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, isn't that the goal for writers? I mean, at least that's mine. Like, Kenley, I want my... thanks for coming on. People will like your book when you die. That's it. That's it. I'm being serious. You know, what? I got a question for the both of you. That's my goal. I want my books to outlast me um, on this earth. What about you two? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah what, what a silly go no, no i want people to already forget about no, i books. want them to burn my books you know when that when i go right no that's not yeah. <laughs> all right well i mean the way that front was just kind of uh teasing me i was like uh is that really dumb all right well i mean it, I <laughs> no think, i don't think it is i wonder if it's the goal for people who are serious about the craft to produce something not the great american novel but but something huge something bigger than they than they are um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I have a, I have a goal that's kind of like that. I want to write a really good literary horror book. I want to write, a, I want to write a haunted house book, you know, but I want it to be fantastic. I don't want it. I don't want it though. The things that I'm writing right now, you know, so I want to move beyond that. So, you can. and then the work, yeah, if, if it affects many people, then great. So, mm -hmm. And the fact that you want to not be pigeonholed not to want the subgenre, I'm putting words okay. in your mouth, but um, that, that's a yeah. great approach. I see a lot of our peers putting down, uh, I'm a horror writer and I'm not knocking them, but uh, after listening to uh, Joe Lansdale will say this a couple of years ago, I forget when, but basically said, I'm not a, this writer, I'm a writer that writes so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, that I love that approach. Um, well, yeah, I mean, and, and he's, he's famous for that. I mean, yeah. that's basically, he, he, he experiments with all kinds of genres. You know, I would, I, one of my favorite, I can't even remember the title of it. I mean, he wrote a, one of my favorite zombie stories. I thought that Joe Lansdale write a zombie story. So he, yeah, he dabbles in that. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, from Batman to Happen Leonard to Bubba Hotel. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> listeners. If you are interested in checking out some reviews, articles, or even a store, a Dead Headspace store, go to deadheadspace.com. Click on the store tab. Uh, final thoughts, Kenzie. Final thoughts. Um, keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> Brennan. <laughs> Kenzie, we appreciate your Tuesday night. Uh, you're in the same uh, you're in the same time zone as us, so it's uh, it's it's getting late there, and you stayed up with us. We appreciate that. Um, listeners, check out Red Station. Check out Redemp. Oh no, it's Reception, isn't it? Check out Reception. Oh, you uh, fucked up. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> uh, because Kenzie's got some, you know, serious talent. 
Um, I, I have not read reception. I'll be perfectly blunt, but, uh, red station was fantastic. And, you know, even, even if you, um, even if you want to dive into the gore, it is so worth the character building that she takes you through to get to know all these people before she just makes these God awful fucking things happen to them. (laughs) Um, so check that book out. Yeah, I, I can't really add anything new. I agree with that. And I'm really excited to see what you come out with next year, Kenzie. And, and thank you for joining us. We absolutely well, thank want you for you. having me. Yeah, it's been fine. For sure. And we would love to have you back sometime. Um, you know, panel or solo, whatever you want. Uh, listeners, thank you for joining us again. Next episode is uh, with Mark Allen Gunnels. He's doing a reading from a book that Brennan and I happen to really enjoy. Where, uh, was where the what's that i i just read his book to be that was was it to be the one about the, the i the, think uh, it is to be yeah yeah uh, that was good that was really good yeah i haven't read that one yet um he's very prolific he seems to be putting out a lot of stuff yeah what's it called where the dead go to die where the dead go to die with yeah. uh aaron dries yeah that book that talk about a zombie book that's different that thing just it's it's its own thing it's amazing but he'll be doing a reading from that that airs next thursday um we got playing more authors and a few roundtables coming out this month in october stay tuned for that and listeners thank you for picking us have a good one If there's anything at all you do not want to talk about, let us know now and we will write it down and not talk about it. Um, I'm trying to think of things that haven't, I don't think so. Um, obviously, you know, don't go into my shady back backstory, but <laughs> no, seriously, there isn't anything really bad. So, okay. Um, I don't and- think. <laughs> we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs>